let me dispel any conspiracy theories. Uh, last week I tried to do a, uh, a stream and I got maybe five minutes into it and there was a very uncharacteristic thunderstorm for New Hampshire. We only get them, I only hear thunder here maybe two or three times a year. I had no idea there was going to be one, but there was uh, a loud uh, crash of thunder and some lightning and uh, I lost internet and I lost internet only for a few minutes but the stream was completely interrupted and uh, the only thing I could do was completely disconnect it. And I don't know why it worked this way, but uh, for the next six hours it said I was live and people who clicked on it would see like maybe five seconds or something of that at the end of the tail end before it got cut off. Because it was cut off and truncated so terribly, I just set it to private. Um, and so you didn't miss anything really. It wasn't, uh, there's no conspiracy. I saw some people posting comments. There's some kind of uh, conspiracy or whatever. Uh, unless unless YouTube was creating a thunderstorm in Manchester, there was no conspiracy. It was just a loss of internet, which has been something that I've had problems with. And I guess I just didn't like the storm. So uh, I will return to that topic because that is a topic I definitely want to talk about. But today I thought about something else. This is a revelation that happened just a couple minutes ago, actually. So very often in the springtime, especially in May, uh, I think about public schools because that's when graduations start to get close. And there's the, the embedded nostalgia of finishing elementary school and middle school and high school and college and all the, you know, it's always a transition period because it's always the spring. I live in the Northern Hemisphere where we get pretty wild springs and we are up we just had the within the last week all the broadleaf and deciduous trees opened up and so we went from brown and gray to deep brilliant greens uh, and it's always really invigorating and nice except for your allergies but uh 25 years ago I was a sixth grader in middle school and I was certainly not an anarcho-capitalist at that time um, my political uh, awareness and my um, historical awareness had really just began right around then when I was 10 I started reading a 1993 World Almanac that I read probably cover to cover several times and that was kind of my first introduction to world history and geography but I certainly did not become an anarchist quite then uh, and around this time 1995-96 uh, I got introduced to some ideas of minarchism from a relative who was an objectivist and also at the exact same moment some conspiracy theories uh, if you want to look up the one that I was introduced to I didn't know the name but the book none dare call it conspiracy it's basically the Rockefellers run everything conspiracy so that had been planted, but those seeds had a long time yet to go to germinate. So I was still what I would describe as something of a national socialist. I believed that America was the greatest country ever and that we never lost a war, even though I knew about Vietnam, but somehow that didn't count. That we were amazing, that we won World War II alone, that we defeated Japan and Germany alone. This is the impression that I got, right? And I would say I wasn't reading yet, but I kind of had the Stephen Ambrose version of world history which is very American-centric and very laudatory of America and blah, blah, blah. And I saw other countries as rivals. Uh, when I started sixth grade, uh, we were asked if we were king of the world, what we would do. And I was a big environmentalist as well, a big Malthusian. And I remember saying that India and China should be submerged into the ocean so that we could wipe out two billion people and lower the population. That's what I wrote as a sixth grader. Uh, and I thought that I was pretty progressive for having that belief at the time. <laughs> uh, hate to say it now. Uh, and uh, later in sixth grade, my town, and I was thinking about this a lot today. I'm from the upper Midwest, and the upper Midwest is settled by immigrants, many, many from Germany. And so I'm mostly German. I'm like three quarters German. Last name's German. Uh, but they were organized and politicized and educated in a very very New England way and I grew up in a small Midwestern town which is very very similar in terms of its civic organization to a New England town now geographically it's different the Midwest is different 
there's way more agriculture there's no mountains there's no ocean the history is not as long you don't build with brick you build from wood and blah 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 there's more space lands cheaper there's lots of important differences that have cultural effects but a New England college town is a lot like a Midwestern college town you know and the idea that education is important and the idea that churches are important and the idea that civic duty is important there was a very strong immigration from New England to the upper Midwest that was augmented by an even larger wave of immigrants from Europe, especially Germany, but also the UK and from Scandinavia and Italy and Ireland and all the other ones. So it is kind of weird if I walk around New England, if I go to a town like Keene in New Hampshire, it really reminds me of my hometown a lot. And it's a small college town and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, I was inculcated in that zeitgeist that education is super important. <coughs> That it's the function of government to provide that, that it's a common good, that's a public good that everyone is kind of entitled to and should have. And that, you know, my view of it basically of government at the time was um, whatever people need, the government should provide. So if people need health care, the government should, should provide that. If they obviously they need they need a military, so it provides that. That wasn't even the question, but welfare, education, environmental control, whatever it was, the government should provide. And I just there was no kind of debate as far as that went in my mind. Um, and I definitely felt that way about education. And by sixth grade, I was somebody who was reading, who was learning about history. I went to Gettysburg when I was 10, and that was really the beginning of my interest in history in a systematic way. And I really believed that you know, public schools were, were like, there was no, you couldn't spend too much money on them. You couldn't do too much in them. If someone said we should extend public school this many years earlier and this many years later, I would have said that's probably a great idea that there's no trade-off, that a, a government program is basically like injecting a, a good resources, injecting it from the ether of space, right? That's not, there's no cost. You're not taking from some people to pay. It's just a wellspring of prosperity that has no cost at all. And my town have been trying, and I've talked about this before, for many, many years to build a new high school. Now, the argument that this would be beneficial is actually really vapid. All right, There's no evidence that a new building will make one student one IQ point smarter or know one more fact or be able to learn math better. This, the textbooks would remain the same. Um, it was just a, a type, well, there's the corruption parts you know, a contractor, uh, when they bought the land, whoever was selling it, there were lots of things. When they when they built the school, they ran the utilities through this area that previously didn't have utilities, which, you know, made them much more valuable to whoever owned them before. But there is just this virtue signaling that education is important and we need a new building to show that, you know, in this town we care about this and we're not going to have a building that's 40 years old or 50 years old or 100 years old. Um, we had a middle school that was about 80 years old at the time and a high school that was about 40 years old at the time. And we were all, <laughs> give you an idea, it's not about free thinking. They're not teaching you to be critical thinking. We were given the assignment of, t of writing why it was good that a, a new school be built. Now, uh, people have been trying to pass a bond issue for more than a decade in a serious way. It had failed repeatedly because it, was a, it is a fairly Republican area in general. College town, lots of blue people there, but they're, you know, like an island. And uh, they basically passed it by shaming everybody, by saying you hate education, and also by promising something to everybody. Oh, your kid's in music? Well, we'll build a new auditorium. Oh, your kid likes to swim? We'll build a new swimming pool. Your kid plays football or track, we'll build a new stadium, even though they already had a stadium that worked just fine that they'd owned for, you know, 80 years, but whatever. You know, uh, you you believe in science. Oh, well, we'll make new labs. There'll be science labs that we currently don't have, uh, which they did build at great expense and then never used. Um, they passed the bond issue. Uh, of course, it helped that 700 employees of the public schools were all able to vote, unlike people who had normal jobs. Um, and it passed. It passed when I was in fifth grade, and when I was in sixth grade, uh, they gave everyone in the middle school the assignment of writing papers on why this was a good thing. Note there wasn't like, let's 
write a paper of whether it's a good thing or not, or do you think it's a good thing, or no. We're telling you, we're telling you the the political truth. It's a good thing. And now your job, studious young future of the world, your job is to write about why that's the case. Well, I I don't know. I guess I understood the arguments pretty well, and I wrote about oh, I, like I knew how to. I didn't want to win the essay or anything like that, just because I wasn't that kind of student. I just I knew what I wanted to write a good essay, and it was oh well. I see people who have to study in the hall, and people have to walk. They had these portable. We called them portables, basically trailer buildings that they had put by the school that you you know would have to go outside and walk you know 20 feet or 30 feet to go to the, those buildings because it just offered a little bit more class space and uh, you know I, that was to me oh that's horrible you know it wasn't really horrible but you had to point out something there had to be a reason and then they selected one kid from every class every year uh, to uh, take part in the groundbreaking ceremonies of this new building that they had passed the bond issue for so I got selected, my essay got picked, and so several months later in May, which is why I'm thinking about it right now, so it's 25 years ago right now, I was out on a windy, vacant lot uh, in this uh, Michigan town. It was actually very cold that day, uh, very cold and windy, and with a, I'm, I'm assuming it was not real gold, but a golden shovel, and we went down the line, and they had one person from every school, or from every grade, all the way, they had people from the 20s, they graduated in the 20s there, we, we scooped it, you know, the, my pride and joy, and, you know, I'm a good fucking student. But there were already at that time seeds that something was awry, okay, because sixth grade was the start of middle school, and many of you know, of course, this was the revelation that we weren't going to take communal showers, which at the time I was very happy with, but, you know, in hindsight, I now see as a huge missed opportunity. Uh, but... We won't talk about that here just now, uh, but in sixth grade we had, you know, social studies, what it was called. Uh, I was always confused why they wouldn't just call it history or geography, but social studies. And the program that we used all through middle school, sixth grade, seventh grade, and ninth grade, was a program, a curriculum called Living Through History. Living Through History. And Living Through History wasn't a case where we would learn about actual historical events. We wouldn't be taught the dates. We wouldn't be taught about economics or the biographies of various people. We wouldn't have any kind of actual history. We would reenact a fictitious version of American history, the primary focus of which, in sixth grade especially, was to make us feel emotional about the Native Americans and to feel bad about what happened to the Native Americans. Now, let see my shirt here. There is a lot of bad things that happened to the Native Americans that we should learn about and know about, and you should be conversant in. But part of that would be like knowing the names of the tribes, knowing the names of the people, knowing about the battles, knowing about the treaties, knowing about the history and the pattern of colonization. None of that None of that was covered, even in the most perfunctory way. We actually, on the ground, the teacher used tape to make a map of a generic, fictitious land. It wasn't actually shaped like the United States, so there was no Florida panhandle or any like It was just a blob. And they said, this is all for you to live in. But then five students were, were deemed uh, colonizers, and progressively over the course of the year, they would take over more and we would be pushed and we were just constantly made to feel really bad and in a vague way and in a way that kind of lets a lot of guilty institutions like the federal government off the hook because it wasn't the federal government that was doing it or the state governments uh, or whoever you know the, the puritans wiping out the nip monk or whatever um it was just this horrible thing, this horrible crime committed against the Indians with kind of, they at the time they weren't saying white people per se, um, but there's a collective original sin that we should all feel really bad about. And at one point, we had to read a book, a famous book, 
which is what I want to talk about in this video. Some of you may have heard of this book. The title of the book is The Education of Little Tree. Now, this book was entirely emotional. Now, I thought it was a little weird. This book is set, it's an autobiogra autobiographical novel about a Cherokee Indian boy growing up in the 20s, in the 1920s. And I remember at the time finding that very strange. How much can we learn about the colonial period or the wars on the Great Plains by reading about a boy, a young boy in the 1920s? He didn't live through any of that. So it's, I mean, you could argue that learning about the Cherokees in the 1920s is a valuable thing in its own right. We've got a bike going by. Um, um, it's, it's nice to live on street level sometimes. Um, but that doesn't teach us about the Dawes Act or Wounded Knee or Crazy Horse or Red Cloud or the Oregon Trail or any of that stuff. And I remember thinking, why would we spend, it took, you know, however long it took the teacher to read that book, which would have been a week or two, it was completely tugging on your heartstrings. Many students cried. They got really sad because there's sad parts to the book. And I would just remember thinking, this is all extremely emotional and doesn't, you know, you could ask the students after, well, what about American history? And all they would be able to say is it's sad or makes me feel bad, but they couldn't actually describe anything. And now there's plenty of stuff in the history that could and should make you feel bad if you're a human being, but we didn't learn any of it. So, you know, why? <laughs> you can't substitute it. And, and I do wonder, I do really wonder what was the arguments for a curriculum like this. Like when this was decided, I wonder if anyone raised their hand and said, I mean, I, I could see there's only two plausible things I could say, One, neither one of which is very good. One would be, well, kids don't care about history and they don't want to learn it, which is largely true. And that might actually be an argument to not bother trying to force people to learn something they don't care about because they won't remember anything. And so maybe we can bait them with emotion. We'll have like be a game, you know, so living through history was like a game that we would reenact and that would be make it entertaining and we'd be invested emotionally, even though we wouldn't have any actual information. And OK. But if that's the bait, there isn't actually a hook because we're not learning anything. We're just learning. And then the other thing is we just want to make the children emotional about this in some vague way. And that can only, I can only describe that as being manipulative in nature. I don't see how there's any other reason why you would do that. Um, but what I just learned just tonight, just tonight, I don't know if anyone's commented this yet, so I hope you haven't ruined it about this book that my teacher cried when she read, that we had to read. Let me read, this is the Wikipedia article on the education of Little Tree. The Education of Little Tree is a memoir style novel written by Asa Earl Carter under the pseudonym Forrest Carter. First published in 1976 by Delacorta Press, it was initially promoted as an authentic autobiography recounting Forrest Carter's youth experiences with his Cherokee grandparents in the Appalachian Mountains. However, the book was quickly proven to be a literary hoax orchestrated by Asa Earl Carter, a KKK member from Alabama heavily involved in the segregationist causes before he launched his career as a novelist. Although claimed to be autobiographical originally, it is now believed that it is only based on Carter's fanciful but fraudulent family claims. Now, some of this should be borne out. When it says that he was active in the KKK, that is an understatement. He created a splinter group of the KKK because he believed the main KKK was not anti-Semitic enough. And he also was into politics and wrote the most famous segregationist speech ever for Governor Wallace, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. This guy, this guy was required reading at my middle school. My fucking dipshit social studies teacher 
who didn't have time to teach us real history, made us listen to this, made us read this as a class together for weeks. <laughs> not only is it fake, fake, and not about the periods in question, it's by a literal white supremacist racist and a plagiarist and a liar, all those, all those things. And I just wonder, like, I just wonder if a single homeschooling family in the United States required somebody to read a book by an author of that repute, even if it wasn't fake, right? Maybe a book about shop class or basket weaving, but by a segregationist clan member there are people at harvard right now who would say this proves that homeschooling should be banned because look the parents are having their students read a book by clansmen and yet we were all required and they know this this is now a famous hoax i'm surprised i didn't know about this before um, they obviously didn't publicize it it's based on the chronology here they knew about this when I was still in school, but we obviously never heard about it at the time. Uh, but are, does this not inv completely invalidate public? Like, how much did the taxpayers of my town pay for us to be taught this? Thousands of dollars per student per year to not learn reality, but to learn lies by a racist and why is there this double standard where they can do that but anything that even remotely approaches that in the most vague obtuse way orthogonal way from a, a private school or a home school god forbid would invalidate the entire system so I just thought that was funny. I wanted to make a video because I was like, I can't believe I just this was this was shocking. I always thought that book was stupid and that it was disingenuous to try and tug at our heartstrings rather than teach us something that actually happened, which an honest teacher. I mean, it, it, I mean, I would say now if students don't care about history, maybe give them a pitch about why it's important. And if they don't buy it, don't try and sell it to them, man. You can't make, you can't force feed this kind of stuff. If they had tried to force us to learn at the, what I'm describing here, they would kids would have hated it and they would have never learned it, and so it would have been a waste of time. Make the pitch if they like it, give it a shot. Then otherwise, why are we wasting time? But don't tax their parents and force them to be in school to listen to this or everything else they teach for that matter. But holy fuck, where's the apology here? I wonder how many schools, I'm sure it wasn't just my little school. It says here, uh, the book was a modest success at its publication, attracting readers with its messages of environmentalism and simple living, because the Nazis are actually pretty good about that for people who don't know, and its mystical Native American theme. Also the Nazis like Native Americans. That's another thing people, I shouldn't conflate KKK with Nazis here, but like, there's a lot of parallels there. The Nazis really had a thing for Native Americans for whatever reason. Uh, it became a bigger, bigger popular success when the University of New Mexico Press released it in paperback and saw another resurgence of interest in 1991. So I'm imagining I'm coming four years after that's probably from that, that wave of interest that maybe that's when they put it in the curriculum. Uh, entering the New York Times bestseller list, and receiving the first ever American Booksellers Association Book of the Year Award. Well, the first ever. My goodness. The, so the American Booksellers Association gave an award for a completely fraudulent book by a Klansman. A radical segregationist Klansman who thought the regular Klan was not sufficiently anti-Semitic for his taste. I wonder, did they retract? I'd be interested to see if they ever retracted that. Uh, it became a subject of controversy that same year when Dan Carter, it's interesting, it's the same last name, um, definitively demonstrated that Forrest Carter was Asa Earl Carter. So the author is actually this Klansman. Um, spurring several additional investigations into his biography, it was revealed that he had been a Ku Klux Klan member and segregationist 
political figure in Alabama who wrote speeches for George Wallace. Family members of Carter's claim that he did have Cherokee ancestry on his maternal grandparents. Said, oh, yeah, yeah. So he's the Elizabeth Warren of literary KKK members. There we go. Fucking rich, dude. Where's the refund? Like, every fucking taxpayer in my town should get a refund. And also for the fucking school that they did build, and it looks nice. Look, I went up there, and so I have nostalgic memories associated with that building. Didn't make one kid one bit smarter, right? Didn't raise test scores, as, as if that even matters. Um, complete waste of time, complete waste of money. There's also some fucked up shit there. Um, this also came to light. Uh, the, the old middle school in my town, which was built in 1920, where I attended middle school, where I learned about the education of Little Tree. Uh, it was across, the, there was a main road, a main thoroughfare in town, right in front of the school, a four-lane road, uh, and there was a Dairy Queen across the street. And there had been cases in the past, way back, where students had been hit by cars. And so the city built a steel-framed footbridge over the road so that students could cross the street in this bridge. Apparently they were pretty, I've never seen another one, but apparently that design was pretty common. I think it was built in the 60s. So it was there, it was there my entire life. Um, when they built this new high school, they sold the old middle school building to a charter school. They sold the building, this, you know, four story acre wide, you know, hundred rooms, whatever it was building. They sold their only football field. The school had a football field. They sold it to the charter school along with the old building. Years later, they realized they never outlined who owned the bridge. I mean, the city built the bridge, and it was originally the city's school. They sell the school. The bridge is partially on the school's property, but it became a property dispute of who actually owned it. So it's kind of funny that they would have this giant deal. It's like you buy a house, and there's a bridge attached to your house, and you fail to delineate, do, do, do I get the bridge? Does the bridge mine? Is it my neighbor's? Oh, who cares? Blah, blah, blah. And then also, they sold their only football field, but they said they'll build a new football field, which they did begin to build in 2000, and now it's 2020. <laughs> Guess how many football games they've had on that field? None. None. They spent money. They started to build it. The track is there. The bleachers are there grade of the field, pay the, put up the lights. I remember they put up the lights in the year 2000. They turned them on to test them, and they never used it. I wonder if those same bulbs are there. Fuck, 20 years later? How much did that shit cost? It cost like 200 grand at least. And the superintendent who masterminded all this, he is a hero, right? He can put on his resume, I get bond issues passed. I, but I, built, I built a school in this town. And so he did such a good job after he retired, the school board gave him a job as an advisor for 250k a year as an advisor. Cost more than the football field that they still don't use. So yeah, that can go in the refund with the little the little tree and uh, they're not learning history. I don't even get me started in high school when, we, when I had geography class. We, we drew literal fake maps. Fake maps and colored them with crayons. Like I'm about to go to college. I was a junior. I was taking college classes at the local university by then. And I was coloring in high school with a teacher who explicitly said she hated children. She had been the librarian for over a decade because she hated children and they forced her back into a classroom and she bitched about it to us and to her union bosses the entire fucking time. So we colored instead. Oh my God. So anyway, cool story. Not a big video here. Uh, 20 minutes, 29 minutes. Pretty good for me. Uh, let me go back and look at these comments, everyone. Anyway, I hope everyone's doing well. Let's go through to see what everyone has to say here. Sorry, guys. I've been... I just want to get that out. I'll get to your comments now. Okay. Uh, my brother, so my brother was telling me you're the top bear. 
you don't seem that hairy to me to be yeah I'm a border bear I'm a borderline bear but sometimes bears have to be fat too um, Stephen Ambrose wrote some interesting history books uh, most cite him for plagiarism on the one well the plagiarism is serious um, he he paid people to do research uh, but the main thing I uh, you know that's serious but like his books are just so bland and superficial and rah, rah, rah on Greatest Generation and all that shit. Um, yeah, I mean, you can read his book on D-Day. What's that called? Citizen Soldier. So so soldier. But there's better books than, than his stuff. Um, did I watch the Sossel LP debate? I did not. He suffered from the paradox, the punishment for being a prolific historian of multiple vault works. Uh, da, da, da. What I don't get is how an uncut guy, a bottom or what? What I don't get, don't get it's how an uncut guy, a bottom and a cut guy an uncut guy is what you wish you were what's top about then top is the man who performs the penetrative sex he is the penetrative partner as opposed to the bottom who is a receptive partner i can't is that you can't possibly not know what that means Did you read more books before or after you started hooking up on Grinder? You know, there is no question. It's not the hook up time itself. It's not like I'm spending a ton of time hooking up, but the amount of time you spend chatting does end up degrading quite a bit. So, I don't know. That's a good one because I, sometimes, like, if I focus on my reading, I can read a lot even with Grinder. Um, my textbook. For economic history in the United States, a very small paragraph on Austrian economics in the Great Depression chapter. I was so surprised when reading about it. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised it got a mention too. That's amazing. Um, My eighth grade social studies teacher literally never taught us anything, didn't give a lecture, didn't even remember him making us watch a video or reading something. Yeah, it sounds about like I had teachers who phoned it in like that every day. Only thing I remember was him spouting off about politics or his version of history. Eventually, he got fired for, quote, accidentally pushing a student down the stairs. Well, I'm surprised he got fired. Hey, sexier than I am. Oh, thanks, Glenn. How many students in your graduating class? I think it was about 168, if I'm mistaken. There are a couple of people who walked who really didn't graduate, but... My history teacher... My history teacher said... I was wrong when I said that the kamikaze was translated as the divine win. She said the correct answer was suicide bombers. Yeah, I have many, many little stories like that. Um, there was one teacher in high school who had been, uh, she'd been teaching since the uh, late 50s or early 60s. Uh, and she was quite old by the time I got there. And she was renowned for being erudite and knowing history and knowing a lot and being a tough teacher you know she graded a little bit harder than other teachers and so she taught got a history in government and um she had uh a reputation as a curmudgeon and blah 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 and so we had a world war ii we didn't have a class on world war ii but it must have been european history but there was a question and it was what is the name of the german assault on the Soviet Union and I wrote Operation Barbarossa. Wrong. The correct answer was Blitzkrieg. And if she had when I I pointed this out and she was like, I'm you're just being a smart ass. That's wrong. I'm like, no, the name of the operation is Operation Barbarossa and that's super famous. That's 
I don't know if there's, I mean, Operation Overlord maybe, but I mean, in terms of like historical importance, that's the most, if you, if you know the name of one military operation in all history, that is the biggest one, like actually by an order of magnitude or two. So you should know that. And to just call it, I was like, Blitzkrieg is a strategy. That's not the name of an operation. The name of the operation was Operation Barbarossa. Ha ha, I'm the teacher. Wrong. Wrong. Shit like that all the time. Oh, yeah, another one. Name, a, a Civil War test. Name a Confederate victory. All right, well, I had done a report in fourth grade on the Battle of Chickamauga, which was a stunning Confederate victory. One of the biggest battlefield victories in the Civil War, a very important battle, Battle of Chickamauga. Well, no, the answer was Chancellorsville, because there was only one, apparently, right? So we studied one. Of all the Civil War battles, we you know, mentioned one Civil War Confederate victory, the, the Battle of Chancellorsville. So I was like, well, I obviously know the Battle of Chancellorsville. I had... In fact, by that point, I'd read Gods and Generals and Killer Angels and uh, The Last Full Measure, the three, the the uh, Michael Shar books on the topic. Well, Killer Angels is Michael Shar, and then uh, the other two are by Jeff Shar. But, and I'd read a whole book on Chickamauga in fourth grade. So I was like, no, Chickamauga was like this very important battle um, south of Lookout Mountain in northern Georgia. No, that's wrong. The answer is Chancellorsville. Are you fucking kidding me? And I had to explain this was a Confederate victory. And she kind of looked at me like, you're just trying to sell your bullshit, you know, to make up. That's just a made up name. All names are made up, bitch, but okay. And I remember, I mean, this is like, this, I mean, Mrs. Arndt, oops. She was reputed to be the smartest teacher, right? She's the most educated. <laughs> The things people don't learn in 50 years of being a teacher. Mm, that's a badass story, Eric. Who's Eric? Lights for a football stadium cost 50K per lamppost, at least in my high school. Yeah, this is in 2000, so it might have been less at that point. Might have only been 25K. They put them in. They turned them on, I presume, to test them, and then they stopped all construction. And they never had a game there. They still have never had a game there. And what's fun, this is also fucked up. They're now adding to the gym. Like, I was home this Christmas, and I met an old acquaintance uh, who, <laughs> the last time I met him, his son was one, and his son is 17 now, so it was kind of another age factor here. But the um, he's like, oh, yeah, the high school is building a, a new addition to the gym. Wait, they never finished the f f f they never finished the football field. They Why Why are we spending how much is that? Who cares do they need it? the school has fewer students? Right they they started a charter school and the population's gone down. So like the number of students is you know, it's, it's like 20 30% less than it was at some at whenever its peak was in the late 2000s. So more money for less kids. What do you mean they never use the football field? What, no football games, no soccer games? Well, good question. So the there's a college in our town, and the college has a football field. So the college has their own stadium, and they have this, you know, college stadium. And so the high school would just have the games there. They didn't have to, they would rent it. They, so they'd have to pay a fee uh, whenever they rent it, but then they didn't have any maintenance costs. And it's actually, I, I think that there was no question that it was much cheaper to do that than to own your own field. The argument was that it's more prestigious to own your own field. To, uh, the fact that we are renting a field from a college, right? Which was, you know, that was almost like prestigious in its own way because. You're having a high school football game on a college stadium, -hoo -hoo. Um, albeit not a huge one or anything like that. It had, it had AstroTurf and all that, but that's where they played the football games. Now, there were soccer fields. The soccer fields did not have stadiums. They were just grass. So there were so the, the, the thing is that when they bought the high school, they bought a huge amount of land, like over a square mile, and only you know a fraction of it 
was developed into an actual facility. Uh, so there's the building itself, and then there were many, many acres. I don't know how many of, of various fields. Uh, baseball fields, baseball diamonds, a practice football field. So there was a practice football field with grass. Uh, and then two, I think two, maybe three soccer fields. But the soccer fields were just fields, and then they had like one bench. The practice football field had no bleachers, no, you know, control box, none of that. And so they were building a football field and they built the berm. You know, so the bleachers were going to have a berm. So they built the berm, but they never put the bleachers on. They never put the control box. They never put the power. It wasn't wired other than for the lights, but there was no. So it was like they built half this and they just continued to use the, um, the uh, football field that the university had which was cheaper. I mean, you're, you're not saddling the, the fucking school with costs forever, but yeah, that's how they did it. The feeling when you need to teach your teachers and also the, the knowledge that they will resent you and punish you for doing so, right? It's not just, oh, thank you for teaching. You're so, I had one teacher, one teacher who said that. My seventh grade teacher, it was her last year. She was about to retire. We, and you know, that we did actually have to like, we would have map tests where we would have a, a map of South America with silhouettes that was blank and we'd have to name the countries and name the um, the capitals. And I said, well, are we going to have a world map test at the end of the year? And she goes, no, I've never done that. That's too hard. And I was like, I want to do it. And so we did do it. Um, I don't think we did it for a grade, but she, she gave me some award and she goes, well, to be honest, he knows more than I did. And she seemed pretty upfront about the whole thing. I think she actually retired and became a lawyer, which is funny because she was old. She'd been teaching for like 35 years. So I wonder, I wonder what ever happened to her. But mostly that would be interpreted as, um, what would be the word? Uh, uppity, rebellious, disrespectful, um, discourteous, uh, not showing the proper respect. And they would be punished. They would not appreciate that. And there's... Obviously, you can say something in a smart, alecky way and be a, a jerk about it, but you can also say, "Hey, this isn't. You don't have to. I, you're stupid. This is wrong." Like, no, there, there were other battles that the Confederates won in the Civil War. They didn't only win one. Otherwise, the war wouldn't have taken four years. Okay, that sounds very smart, assy. That's not what I said. But Chickamauga, Fred, Fredericksburg, right? The first Battle of Bull Run. The second Battle of Bull Run seven days right we can go on and on and on they want a whole bunch of fucking battles <laughs> um but uh yeah you get punished for that they don't they're not going to reward you for that you're going to get punished for that the the, stu the student who says chancellorsville and that's the only thing that they know they get more prestige and more accolades than the student student who knows much much more than that and dares to like impugn them Ryan Dawson has done some great work on civil civil war revisionism. I w okay, I love Ryan Dawson, and it's good that he talks about that. I would not say he does great work. He's repeating great work, which is very admirable, very admirable. But I, I don't know how much of that's original, and I think he would even admit that. Um, I visited the Battle of Chickamauga. Yeah, I also visited the Battle of Chickamauga. I visited the Battle of Chickamauga in 1994. It had a lot of fire ants. It's still, I don't know, it's, I wonder if it's still there. Um, it's not like Gettysburg or some of these other places that are huge parks, but there's there are monuments there. Um, it's not a well-known battle because the South won and because it, strategically, it was strategically very important in the short term. It led to the siege of Chattanooga and then subsequently you know, the Battle of Lookout Mountain and um, the basically the, the strategic defeat of the Army of Tennessee. Uh, in retrospect, a lot of my public school curriculum was designed to dumb people down. In grammar school, they would talk about how using more than a certain number of words in a sentence makes something a run-on sentence. Stephen Koza, I have just learned that one of the ways you can hypnotize people is with run-on sentences. If you have a run-on sentence that never ends with no period and you just use on and 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 but and continue and go on, and add more and more meaningless words that never end and go on, it actually can put people in a trance. Um, but yeah, I I say this when I when you read like newspapers or letters or journals, even from regular people from the mid uh, 19th century and even the late 19th century, 
the level of grammar and vocabulary and the um, the amount of improvisation and the skill and the the it's just the pros are better dude I cannot write like that or I would have to work very hard to be able to do it and I'm sure I know that there were lots of people who couldn't but there are lots of people who were not highly educated you know they didn't go to Harvard um, who could so I think that this idea that we've become that I mean there's this this most stupid myth ever that we were illiterate before public school someone's gonna message that on here I swear because I've had someone who's come on there you could make the argument that maybe they raised literacy, but the idea that there was no literacy before is like patently false, completely false. And I would argue that the level of literacy has gone down a lot. There's a small debate there. You could say that, well, we've included now more, more people can read. And so the average has gone down because there's a lot of people, you know, who maybe have IQs in the 80s who are very low class who still know how to read. What good that does them is a good question, but I, I would say, but you don't, even the highly literate writers, like, are very low level compared to just kind of the run-of-the-mill people 150 years ago, so. Uh, my U.S. midterm, history midterm, had a question saying, what did Shays' Rebellion illustrate? The correct multiple choice answer was that the U.S. needed a stronger and more centralized government. Oh my fucking God, I'm not surprised by that at all. No, it demonstrated that the revolution had been betrayed and that Washington was a tyrant and that you can't have uh, direct tax and taxes on whiskey are, are illegitimate. No, I love that. How that is presented as a fact, as an objectively correct answer, just like we were told you have to write an essay about why this is good, not if this is good or should it be done or why should it be done, that it's good. Try reading Locke or John Stuart Mill after having read not after never even read a sentence longer than twenty words in your entire life. Uh, there's only one Confederate monument at the great CSA victory. How odd. Um, I don't know if there's only one monument. It's just not a big. You know, Gettysburg is, I mean, Gettysburg is, is unique in that it's a huge tourist attraction and there's so many monuments there. It's ridiculous. There's so much. And so no other site even really compares. Vicksburg maybe a little bit. Um, it doesn't compare, but that would be the closest that I've seen anyway. Um, but most of them have kind of become like a historical marker or a plaque, something like that. And Chickamauga is... It's more than that. There's a couple spots you can go to, but they're not well. They're not well attended, and you know whatever. It's history, so I'm not one. There's a lot of historians who think that that shit should be preserved forever, and I think that that is very debatable. Um, should, they have a historical value, and if they do, then they will. They will stay. But there are other potential uses for the area, and I think that you know human society should go on, and not we should learn from the past, but we shouldn't live in it. So. Uh, I have zero compassion for the natives who failed to evolve with the weapons of the war. Why they would, why would anyone have American guilt about that? Well, Darren, I think that that is, first of all, wrong. Like many Native Americans did learn to use the weapons of war and so if you read about say king philip's war in 17 or 1675 and 1676 the native americans typically used flintlocks much more than the puritans who used matchlocks because they were more effective in uh fighting in bad terrain and the puritans were just more conventional and you know they matchlocks were cheaper and they were just used to that the same can also often be said for the Plains Indians. Well, like if at Wounded Knee, for instance, most of the Native Americans, most of the Lakota, were armed with, you know, uh, repeating rifles, and most of the, uh, you know, troopers, the uh, dragoons, were armed with Springfields that were single shotters. So that's false. Also, think the whole stuff of disease can't be underestimated here. We're all monked up about COVID nineteen killing 0.5 percent or whatever. We, we were getting pandemics that were killing at least 50%, maybe 
80, 90 percent in some cases. And then that wouldn't be like the one shot. That would continue over and 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 over again. And I don't know when they finally ended. It was probably, it's definitely not until like the 20th century. So I think that that's really an unfair reading. Now, that is not to lionize them or to say they didn't make mistakes. They were raft with infighting, but it's almost wrong to even call it infighting because they were distinct tribes who hated each other's guts. If they had all completely united early enough, they might have been able to do something. But, you know, early enough, it wasn't so obvious that it needed to be done. By the time, it was one of those things that by the time the threat is realized, it's too late. So I think that it's wrong for you to have zero compassion for Native Americans. They did horrible things. You should learn about the tortures that they did and the mistakes that they made and their bloodlust for each other, which often was quite unparalleled. You know, the Lakota Sioux, who are the big heroes and all the Westerns, or, you know, the revisionist Westerns anyway, their main goal was to genocide other tribes, especially the Crow. You can go out west and find the massacre sites. I slept on one. Right? Pulled over on the side of the road, unable to sleep after a day at Yellowstone. And it turned out to be a, a battlefield where the Lakota had wiped out a, a big bunch of the Crow. And there had been, a, in 1820, they somehow snuck into a Crow village and killed like 20% of their population. So, but it's the idea that they, they were just dumb and didn't know, like they kept using bows and arrows because they didn't understand like guns. Hey, they did understand guns. Uh, some of the some of the Algonquins even had blacksmiths and forges and were figuring out how to, to smith them. Um, I remember in public schools, the textbooks claimed that there was, quote, chaos under the Articles of Confederation because the government was, quote, too small and there wasn't a central currency. Yeah, well, that... <laughs> Alexander Hamilton said so. You know, and the fact that this was debated at the time, gone. You know, did you read any of the Anti-Federalists? No. No, never. May, you maybe never. I, like, I had vaguely heard of them. I don't, pretty sure I didn't hear about them in school, though. Because I was still very vague on what that was all about in college. I remember John John Mogopoulos referencing the Anti-Federalists, and I was like, who the fuck are they? And he was getting into how they were the true Federalists, and the Federalists stole the name. And this was all interesting stuff that's completely not even covered in high school. Um... Uh, Shays Rebellion wasn't the Whiskey Rebellion over the tax on whiskey. Well, they're two. They happened at the same time. There's a Chickamauga Dam. Who was King Philip exactly? So, Tortoise Dream. You don't know who King Philip is. King Philip was a Wampanoag uh, or Nip Monk. Can't remember, but he was. Uh, he lived in Central Mass, or maybe... No, no, he lived on uh, Mount Hope, which is basically in uh, Narragas... Nar it's in Rhode Island today. Uh, so he was a king, a ch sachem, whatever, chief of... I want to say the Wampanoag, but it might have been the Nip Monk. So it's, it's 1675, and New England... At that time, Massachusetts wasn't one colony. You had Boston Colony, and you had Plymouth Colony, and then you had Connecticut and Rhode Island. But the, the settlement pattern was basically the coast, so parts of the Cape, Boston Harbor, Plymouth Harbor, and then up the Connecticut River. And then the area in between, you know, Springfield Mass, Central Mass, was pretty much still inhabited by Native Americans. Uh, and he was the sachem of this, uh, I think it's Wampanoag or, or the Nimbuk. I think it's Wampanoag uh, tribe. And he had been... His father had been allies with the pilgrims and all that. I think uh, his grandfather had taken part in the first Thanksgiving. And he was given a Christian name. So that's where the King Philip comes from. He actually, uh, he spoke very good English and he actually went to Harvard. Uh, surprising fact here. He went to Harvard and I think he might even have, have had a degree. So he was very... Um, I don't want to say bicultural, but like he spoke English. He knew about Puritan ways. At that point, there were many um, so-called praying Indians or Christian Indians. So there was a lot of cultural mix going on, at least settlers to natives, not so much the other direction, but some. And there became concerns uh, that the Puritans in Plymouth Colony specifically were getting a little bit too 
I mean, at the, at the time, there were certain ideas, like if there was a, a dispute between the two, like if a murder was committed, the jury should be half and half uh, natives and whites. And basically, the Plymouth Colony started saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're You're our subjects. You're just subject to our law. You just have to live with it. It's not like a, a treaty between equals or anything like that. Um, and then the governor of Plymouth Colony died mysteriously, neck broken, found under a frozen lake, a frozen pond. And so the... Plymouth Colony decided that the Wampanoag were probably going to attack. It's an interesting question whether or not they were or not. I don't think we know for certain because there's no written record from their part. Um, and so they attacked King Philip at his place on Mount Hope, which is, I think it's in present-day Rhode Island on the coast. He escaped, and the Nipmunk and Wampanoag Indians went to war against New England, and they killed 30% of the population of New England. So... This does make it the most deadly war in American history in per capita in terms of existential threats. This is the one, other than like the Tidewater Wars and the very early wars when like Virginia was first settled, these are the wars that were the most devastating to the colonies uh, in terms of their potential to wipe them out. By the time of the American Revolution, there was not any question of, of pushing the whites back into the sea. That was not going to happen. It might have happened then. He set back colonization like 30 years. They emptied out the Connecticut River Basin, basically destroyed all the town. They burned the towns. They'd kill everybody. And like I said, they killed about a third of all the white people in New England. So it was so funny. So a guy who went to Harvard nearly wiped out New England. You know, okay. Uh, the Puritans were very ineffective. They, had, they couldn't really find the Indians. They couldn't catch up to them. And so they would get attacked, sneak and run repeatedly. Um... They managed to antagonize other Native American groups by attacking them. They basically thought, oh, well, we don't want... So I'm thinking he was a, he must have been a nip, nip monk ch uh, chief because they attacked the Wampanoag to try and prevent them from joining the war, which, yeah, they massacred a bunch of Wampanoag, but the ones they didn't massacre then did join the war against them. Uh, it ended up being the case that the Puritans really weren't able to fight this guy, um, but the Iroquois were. The Puritans went to the governor of... New York. So the Puritans had their own charter, Plymouth and Boston Colony, or Massachusetts Bay Colony. I don't know why I would call them Boston, but Massachusetts Bay Colony had basically their own independent charter, and they kind of saw themselves as sovereign independent states, um, whereas New York was a royal, royal colony administered by a governor, Governor Andros, who was appointed by the king. They had just retaken New York from the Dutch uh, about a decade before, I think in 1664, 1666, something like that. Um, and there was kind of this, yes, we'll protect you, but you have to submit to the king. Uh, and the governor of New York really didn't do anything, but he just went to the Iroquois, especially the Mohawk, and said, hey, kick the ass of the, of the Algonquins, kick the ass of um, uh, King Philip and the Wampanoag and the Nipmuc, which they subsequently did. And he actually went back to his original home in Mount Hope and was then killed there by a praying Indian, no less. And that was the end of King Philip and all those tribes, basically. They were wiped out. Um, <laughs> so that that's kind of the start of, I mean, there was history before that, but that, um, yeah, so that's what King Philip was. And uh, there's a really good book if you're interested in it. Um, 1676, the year America lost its independence. 1676, the year America lost its independence. There's also Independent of this, quite quite independent of this, there was also a rebellion called Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia at the same time, pretty much unrelated, although Indians factored in that as well. But um, basically, the King of England said, okay, I'll protect you from the Indians, but then you can't be independent anymore. Yeah, King Philip's War. If American Indians were unified and armed themselves more than America, then, then America would be much different, diverse society with newer innovations of multiple tribes. I'd say that would have been way different. Oh, it depends when they would have done it, but it's also very unlikely that that ever would have happened, right? The first Europeans land, they don't all know what's going to happen. No one knew what was going to happen. Shays' Rebellion was a revolt against the insider trading of government officials and their friends 
when they brought up all the war bonds from ex-soldiers when they were worth zero. Congress passed a law saying that the bonds would be paid back in full. Insiders in the government knew ahead of the time before the law was passed and blah, blah. Yeah, it sounds about right. It sounds, uh, in um, Autumn of the Black Snake, he talks about um, Washington going and surveying all the land and the, uh, for the back in the colonial times for Virginia Colony and then giving himself all the best land. I mean, can't make this shit up. Um, good night, Glenn. Nice seeing you. Would you consider Nat Turner a criminal? No. If so, would you say the slaves who murdered those responsible for the, their enslavement should be deemed evil? No. That's a hard no on that. I just wish he had had more guns. Whiskey Rebellion was not in fact during the same time, 1791 to 1794. Ah, close enough. Indians were smart, deadly warriors. Sure, I'm glad the Brits were successful. Bring us this glorious country. Um, I recommend you check out the Dangerous History Podcast on Spotify. He's an ANCAP history professor. He has an entire series on the American Revolution, Shays, Whiskey Rebellion, and more unknown. Okay, I've heard of it. I've never listened. Libertarian bias is that natives. Where did I? Natives are like libertarians against the evil, greedy federal government. Well, first of all, whatever we may or may not think or care about the Native Americans, the federal government is evil and greedy. Uh, and I haven't once said the Native Americans were libertarian, and that doesn't matter. Like, so if they are, or aren't, it doesn't make a difference whether they had a plague or not, or whether the federal government violated treaties against them, which they did. Now, this is just interesting because I've talked at length about Native Americans being genocidal and cruel and blah, 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 and aggressive in so many ways and their own worst enemies, which they very often were. But somehow I'm an apologist for them. Boop, boop, boop. Let's go link streaming again. And the, for those of you who didn't hear, I, the last time I tried to do a stream, there was a thunderstorm and uh, lightning struck and I lost internet. And that was it. And I tried to turn the stream off. I turned the computer completely off and it remained streaming for six hours. Who knows why? Uh, nobody could watch it. Nobody could see anything. I'll redo that video. I do want to do a video on submission and obedience, but we'll get there. Why do you think Nat Turner isn't a criminal? Because he killed his oppressor because he was being enslaved against his will. And so he tried to liberate himself and others. And if innocent people died in his attempt to do that, that is lamentable. That is the fault of the people who are attacking him. If I, if I get attacked, say somebody you know starts to bust down my door, and I don't want to die or get enslaved or whatever. So I pull out a gun and I start fighting. And one of my bullets, you know, kills an innocent person. That's that's sad. That really is sad. It's not my fault. It's the person who attacked me's fault. That's kind of how that works. That's how it works here with Nat Turner. He was enslaved against his will. He wanted to go. Slavery is immoral. It's wrong. It's a violation of his rights. He had every right to be free. And... Uh, you know, if only he had been more successful. How's the Free State Project going in New Hampshire? It's going good. Having Pork Fest. Oh, by the way, uh, Pork Fest is definitely happening this year. Um, I bought my tickets. Tickets are very cheap because they don't know who's going to go. So it's $25. Uh, Tom Woods is going to be there. He's making a point to go. So he should be there. I'll do a whole, you know what? I'll do a whole video on Pork Fest actually uh just to encourage people to go but it's doing good that will be our big event this year i'm definitely going to go 
Uh, so if you are able to get to New Hampshire, I think it's uh, the last week of June, consider doing it. It's a great time. Hey, Lengthy, it's 6 a.m. here in Athens studying right now. Nice to see you again, live again. Hey, Dread Pirate Alex, it is nice to see you live as well. What are you studying? American Indians came over from Asia and they were when oh, there was a land bridge between Alaska and Russia. That's the story. That's not the only version, though. What's it like to live in New England? Uh, it's fine. Uh, New England is definitely not like the rest of the country, but that's true of everywhere in the country. It's very town-centric. I like the mix of urban and rural. So uh, Manchester is big enough. It has everything you need. Gyms, restaurants, people to meet. Uh, places, places to go, everything you need, you know, repair wise or, or um, logistically wise, but it's not crowded. It's not expensive. The traffic's not bad ever, really. Um, there's none most of the time. At at peak, it's a little bit, but that's only occasionally. If you want to go to a big city, New York's four hours away. Boston's less than an hour away. So if you really crave that, that's something you can do on a daily basis if you want. But if you want to get out, uh, there's rural areas nearby. There's campgrounds nearby. There's mountains nearby. <laughs> there's 1,300 peaks. There's a pair of them just to the west of Manchester that kind of dominate the skyline, which I could hike every day if I wanted. Um, if you are willing to drive an hour or more, there's amazing hiking in all kinds of different places in the state. The ocean is not far. It's about an hour. Vermont's not far. So there's a lot to do. Um, and... It's nice. It's very different. Like I said, it's very town centric. In the other parts of the country, the states are more important and the towns are more subsidiary to the states. But in places like uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, to a lesser extent, Maine uh, and, and, and Mass, the, um, the towns are really, really important. So it's nice. I really like it here. It's definitely it definitely feels like home. Michigan feels like where I'm from. New Hampshire feels like where I am. I agree it's the same principle with someone stealing your property and giving it to an innocent that never deserved it. Property rights is the main core of freedom. Long live Nat Turner. Yeah, I think and it's funny that we, you know, we did living through history. Did we learn about Nat Turner? No, we did not. We were too busy reading books by a KKK member. Have you ever been to upstate New York? Uh, it depends what you mean by upstate. Obviously, the I-90 corridor, many, many times. Syracuse, Utica, Buffalo, um, Albany, Schenectady, Georgetown, Johnsontown, uh, Oneida, blah, blah, blah. Many, many times. I have, I mean, I've got a string of gay hookups along there. Um, if you mean the Adirondacks, no. I have not been up to the Adir Adirondacks, Lake Placid, any of that area. Uh, basically, I-90 and south. That's it. In other news, oh, wait. Yeah, I love New York City, but living there would be something else. Boston is hella influenced by the universities. Yeah, that's definitely true. Boston is the most college place probably in the world. I think that there's like 27 universities in the city limits you've got obviously at Harvard MIT but Northeastern Boston College Boston University uh, Tufts um, I can't even think of them all there's so many um, uh, Riviere Rensselaer no that's in New York there's a ton and they say like the actual population of Boston turns over every four years as a result so they are heavily influenced by that, especially Harvard. Harvard and the Massachusetts Bay Colony go. I mean, the the relationship between Harvard and Boston is much stronger and goes back much further than the relationship between Boston and the federal government, or Boston and Massachusetts, even though the capital is in Boston. So that they are institutions that are very, very, very important. And I don't think, like Dartmouth is in New Hampshire. Dartmouth does not have anything like that kind of influence over New Hampshire, like not even remotely infinitesimally, which you'd think it almost would because New Hampshire is so much smaller. 
New Hampshire's 1.3 million people. Boston's closer, or Manchester, or, excuse me, Massachusetts is closer to 10 million. So, it, but it's not like. But you know, I don't live there. I can visit there. I can go there when I want. Go to the Freedom Trail, Quincy Market, Fanning Wheel Hall. There's a lot of amazing history in Boston. Uh, a lot of good food. You can go to oyster bars that fucking um, Daniel Webster used to eat at, for Christ's sake. Like the same bar, the same owner, all that stuff. So that's pretty cool, but you don't have to live there. Boston's expensive. It's crowded. The roads are shitty. Road, the driving in Boston's a nightmare. Um, it's a funny shape because of the coast and the way it's set up and the way it was settled. So Boston was originally a peninsula that at a high tide was only like, I think, 20 yards across. And they've slowly been filling it in. And so there's big parts of the city now that used to be underwater. So Back Bay, for instance, is an area that used to be that way. Now it's completely covered. There. Um, but yeah, I like being able to visit there. I would not want to live there. The taxes are ridiculous. The regulations are ridiculous. Owning a gun is a pain in the ass. It's illegal. Carrying a gun is almost impossible. Not that I carry all the time, but like it's nice that you should have the freedom to do that. Uh, cool. I live near Albany. Yeah, I've driven through Albany many, many times. Albany and Troy and that whole area. But I will very rarely stay there because it's close enough to Manchester that's two and a half, three hours away, so I wouldn't stop. Um, do you balance your interest in history with speculation on the future? No, I do not think that that is impossible, really. I just... When you hear people, when I hear people speculate about the future, I'm like, come on. And I try not to let myself fall for it either. The history, history is amazing and we should learn it to understand the present, but it doesn't predict the future necessarily. Yeah, I find it weird how public schools never talk about people like Spooner, Nat Turner, Frederick Douglass, and many other fighters for their freedom against the state. One, one day their names will. Be honored. Yeah, it's funny that like you'd be much more likely to read Tanahasi Coates than you would Frederick Douglass, even though Frederick Douglass was like literally was a slave and a, and very important historical figure and very like wonderful writer. If you read his stuff, so um, I think there's a reason for that because they didn't have the social justice warrior angle of this. The actual slaves didn't call for a welfare state. They didn't call for mass redistribution in general. Not in the type that we'd have today. Um, and so they don't get brownie points for them. So we have to read about intersectionality instead. And I don't think the students would understand it. Because the stuff is too smart. My history teachers was trying to compare owning slaves in the past to owning guns today. She said... You can take my slaves from my cold, dead hands if you know what I mean. Then went on comparing the two. What a stupid fucking comparison. The owning a person versus owning an inanimate object. What if, like, and that's, that's somebody who thinks they're being clever. I have this saying, so one of my few sayings. Uh, liberals are seldom so stupid as when they think they're being clever. That's a good example of it. It's similar to when you talk about gun control and they say, well, but wouldn't the state just use nukes? Yeah, yeah, they're gonna nuke themselves to get the militia. It that's such a. And if you tried to argue with her, she would have given you a bad grade and said you're a bad student. I'm thinking about moving to M A Vermont or Maine for job opportunities. Is why I ask. You should move to New Hampshire. Mass is too high taxes. Vermont and Mass both have high taxes and high regulations. Maine is fine. I wouldn't. I wouldn't criticize Maine. Maine and New Hampshire is where it's at. They're much nicer. They're much cheaper. You can do everything else. You can work in Boston. There's plenty of people who live in New Hampshire and work in Boston. Public schools in my day talk more about Douglas, Nat Turner. Slave Rebellion. No, not in my day. We read about, we read books, we read fake books about fake Indians by KKK members. And then we just pretended, we played pretend land to feel emotional about the Native Americans instead of learning a single thing that actually happened. 
Uh, my history teacher said that on our last Zoom live stream last week. I'm still shook. Wait, wait. Is this college Zoom or is this middle high school Zoom? Most teachers care about paycheck to indoctrinate children than being consistent in their job to give out the right information to empower kids more. Uh, I have to sneeze really bad. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I think that I think most teachers, not all, most teachers are kind of lazy and they want to they want a, a job security, which I understand people wanting job security. It's like you get the job, you get tenure, and you're basically good. You get two months off. Uh, some teachers do work hard, so so called. They put in a lot of effort, but they don't have to. You can put you can basically phone it in, and your pay doesn't really get affected. But you know, most people want to find that there's meaning with their job, and so if you're a teacher, how are you going to find meaning with it? And the arguments we're given for public schools are that they're there to train skills and knowledge. And so you could see people who say, okay, that's what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to try and impart all these skills and knowledge to my class. But the problem there are twofold. A, that doesn't work. They won't remember it. B, what you're trying to teach them is very questionable. So you could be, you know, a trigonometry teacher, let's say, for high school kids. And you could decide, you know, I want to have meaning in my life, so I'm really going to really teach trig trigonometry hard. But not one of your students in a hundred is going to be interested in it. And that one might only be interested in it because he wants a good grade or she wants a good grade. Very rare will be there one to be like, yeah, I actually want to do something that this is important for. And then I, and that's wonderful when that happens, but then that's ignoring the 99.9% .9 of the times where that didn't happen. So what do you do instead? Because that's clearly not what's happening. The kids aren't learning the information and they're not there for the information. And even if you try and even if you're quote a good pedagogue, they're not going to retain it. And even if they do, how valuable is the information? It's not. So what can you do instead? Well, you can do politics. You can shape their politics. If you have a political bias, then this is the perfect place for you to try and overtly or covertly shape people's thinking. So that's what they do. And then because they morally believe that they uh, are right, uh, and that they have the authority of the state behind them, then they feel perfectly willing to do them. Not not always, but many, many times. And so we have to get lectures about Little Tree. Do you think the quality of public schools varies widely massed California to Alabama? Well, that very much depends on the metric that you use to define quality. Um, you know, if you're talking about spending per pupil or, you know, the logistics of the buildings or the amount of degrees of the teachers, then they do vary. They do vary from place to place to place. And West Virginia is usually one of the worst. Some of the schools in the South, like Alabama and Mississippi, are pretty bad. And then New York is good and Michigan is good and Texas is okay. and blah, blah, blah. So they vary in that sense. If you're talking about in some objective good in terms of outcomes of their students, no. No, I don't think that they really matter at all. It's all crap. This just some of the crap costs more than some of the other crap. I have a bad feeling the civil war is coming closer to America to this level of stupidity. It's not the stupidity so much as the fact that we have a divergent population that cannot talk to itself. You know, like Half the population looks at something and goes conclusion A, and the other half goes conclusion B, and they're mutually exclusive, and they hate each other. So that's going to be a problem. Florida is where it's at. My brother lives in Florida. He lives in Tampa. Uh, for the record, California public schools suck, okay? It's a community college. I'm still supposed to be in 12th grade, technically, if you're wondering my age, though. Yeah, you have a clever teacher there telling you how it's like guns. What would be the clever comeback there? I should think of one. I mean, does she think we should go to war against gun owners and wipe them out and free the guns? Free the guns. Abolitionists for guns. We're going to free the guns and set them free. Put them on welfare. Now, does she, and also does she think that, like, black people who own guns, I wonder how she feels about that. They don't exist. 
be, would be my guess. All right, guys, hour 19, getting tired. Let's do last call here. That's all I pretty much wanted to talk about. Ugh. I had a long day. Homeschooling versus public school. Come on, Savvy Symbio. What a stupid question. Obviously, obviously, public schools are better. The teachers are better trained. They have better curriculum. The schools are nicer. Um, and the the homeschoolers could end up making their students read fictional stuff by racists. So that's totally unacceptable. And any kind of institution that would ever do that should be completely banned forever. So there you go. I hypnotized my first person in person today. That was fun. Advice for siblings who see that their parents are ambivalent towards poor education standards. Well, I don't know what two siblings would do. The poor education standards are... Um, not something you can really control. So, and the parents can't control it either. So, the only thing you could really do there is to become homeschooled. So, if you're really worried about it, try and get them to homeschool you. My second son will be soon be born. It's a good feeling giving him the things I never had. Child lead. Child lead learning and peaceful parenting for the win. Oh, that's wonderful, X Paladoc. Congratulations. I didn't even know you had children. Hopefully, he'll be uncircumcised as well, obviously. Can't not say that. Can't not say that enough. Congratulations, though. Any update to the Soviet Union series from last April? What the fuck? I don't remember that. That was last April. For example, enrolling kids in Christian private schools, but then seeing that one day they are doing tough math, the next day they are on a different book that's easy math. I mean, the, I, I really do think that child-directed education is the best and some variant of homeschooling around that. I So I, I, I don't want to criticize the pedagogy there because that's not necessarily a bad pedagogy necessarily. I think everyone has a different pedagogy, so the idea that that might be bad for you, it might be good for somebody else, is switching the math. I wonder why people even learn math, to be honest. Uh, which religion is worse, communism or Islam? That would be communism. That's easy. If a man with a restored foreskin hooks up off on grinder or scruff, should he tell the guy that he is Restored or act like he's intact. I would act like you're intact and see what they think. Have you considered scheduling live streams in advance? I've thought about it a little bit, but not really. It's basically whenever I feel like it. Is, is the outsized emphasis on athletics in public schools the cause of their decline? No. Well, first of all, I don't know how what the basis for saying they have declined is. They get more funding, they have more students, they're not declining in any meaningful sense other than nobody's in them right now, which is wonderful. Um, I actually, th there's an, an interesting question there. I think that it's better if students are actually out playing a sport than in a classroom. I, I actually think that, that is probably a better use of their time because they're into it and they can excel at it and they can learn more social skills and obviously they can take communal showers with it. So I don't, does it, it doesn't it does impact academics but the value of the academics is highly questionable and that's not to say that learning is questionable i love to learn as you see but what happens in school does not really count as that uh i don't call it uncircumcised i call it being intact well that is that is the correct terminology so good 
have actually gone out in public and made videos damning circumcision. Are they on your channel? I'll have to look it up. My sons will be intact. Well, that's wonderful, x -Paladot. Congratulations to you and your sons that I didn't realize you had. Uh, it's so exciting to find out my econ teacher was an Austrian economist. That must be so rare in Austria at my community college in LA County. Oh, that's terrible. Um, they're out there. I mean, I often got the impression that every single Austrian economist was at the at the Mises Institute, and that's really not true. There's many, many, many more than that who just aren't there. You never hear of. So there's some at my local colleges. They're out there. They're you know, they're not as rare as you might think. They are still rare, though. Thoughts on Yaron Brook? Well, I'm not, I don't like objectivism that much, and he seems insufferable to me, even though he's right about most things most of the time. Um, how likely is it in the future, near future, that people won't go to college and instead will focus on technical certificates to get their front door in the job market? Well... In the near future, everybody doing that is unlikely. In the near future, more people doing that, very likely. That's definitely going to happen. How many, I don't know. How fast, I don't know. But that's, that's I think we're going to see a trend in that direction. Uh, but people aren't going to stop going to colleges altogether. Much as I might like that. ex -Paladoc. I definitely have to check that out, ex -Paladoc. How did that go when you went out and protested? What kind of reaction did you get? My brother and I were discussing this topic. Is there a logical case for the existence of morality? Why should it? Should it be considered, as my brother would say, a lie made to control the weak? I wasn't satisfied with my own answer. Yeah, wonderful question. I'm not going to answer it at the end of my live stream. <laughs> Sorry. Not that I even have the best answer to that. Um, Do we really think these social distancing measures will stand this coming fall school year? They should just cancel school, to be honest. And 128. Okay, guys, I am going to call it quits for the night. Thank you for watching. Don't send your... Yeah, Xpolitex, thanks for messaging. I'll check out your video. I'd be interested to see that. Um, thanks everyone for watching and only fools send their kids to public schools.